So we're going live today with the lecture we had yesterday. Yesterday we had a lecture in Spanish language, but for those who wanted this information in English, I'll always try to make uh, separate videos in English and Spanish. So yeah, because a lot of you people have written me that the information is really cool, but that sometimes you struggle with the Spanish language, obviously. People in the US or abroad. So don't worry, I got you covered. And actually, I'm going to show some extra pictures that I didn't have the chance to show yesterday. So you're lucky if you're seeing this live in English. So basically, I'm just waiting for more people to connect. And by the way, you can get your, I don't know, a hot cup of tea or coffee, whatever you want, so that you can relax and enjoy this lecture. I tried to do this lecture a little bit later uh, uh, instead of doing it earlier because um, a lot of people in LA, so I'm chatting already. You can chat and ask me any questions and probably, I don't know, but probably I'll answer yours. But uh, without a doubt, I'll be reading any comments that you make. And yeah, so I was saying that a lot of people are watching me from L.A. and from the West Coast. So right now on the West Coast, it's going to be 6 p.m. Is that right? 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah. Okay, it's 9 p.m. for me. So it's 6 p.m. for you guys on the West Coast. So that's why the English language version of this lecture is going to be, I'm going to try to do it like later um, at uh, different hours. Like if I do it in Spanish, it's going to be more focused to Mexico City. But if I do it in English, it's going to be more focused for anyone living in the West Coast. So yeah, on the West Coast, I guess it's already time. Because I announced this on Twitter, by the way, on Twitter and several of my social media that I was going to do this lecture. So this the lecture is about is Mesoamerican system, the Mesoamerica system, ancient Mexico, ancient Central America, like the Aztecs, Mayans, were they leftists or right winged? So that's what we are going to explore. The answer is going to surprise a lot of you but if you know your history not that much but yeah so anyway but anyway this lecture is about exploring the the different views political views from ancient Mexico and Central America versus what we know today from Europe because after all uh, those views like left-winged and right-winged were imported from our new world. Our new world is Europe, by the way, because that's the world we just got to know five uh, centuries ago. But this is our old world, old world, and this in our old world, uh, at least we have a different set of political economic and social views. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to to comment on the chat. So Erica is giving me the heads up that everything say okay, right? Okay, so I'm starting the lecture. By the way, lect the lecture is going to be recorded for anyone to consult. So what we see here, it's what we know as our ancient ancestors, cities and palaces and uh, these usually complex of different palaces from where our ancient rulers used to govern. But not only that, it's not only about the political, but also what went behind all things economics and all things social as well. Now, yesterday I was talking in the Spanish version that um, political science student gave me these pointers on how to identify the different variants of socialism, for instance. So, 
It says four fundamental principles common to all variants of socialism. It says, number one, socialists are hostile to free market economy as to the best way to maximize human happiness. Planned economy liberates from the undesirable consequences of, for instance, poverty, suffering, unemployment, a free market economy and private entre entrepreneurship. That's not me saying it. That's this definition brought to me by this political, political science student. So, in college, you're seeing that being a socialist, usually, like, usually is not a golden rule, but usually are the different variants of socialism are hostile to, free, uh, to a free market economy because this maximizes human happiness. Now, we know for a fact that there was, let me show you, a free market, and actually our indigenous ancestors were into, uh, big time into free markets, so much that there's this culture around markets uh, in Nahuatlis, the Tianquistli, uh, in the times of the Aztec, and not, not only the Aztecs, but we know that's what we know more about from the Aztec Empire and the Nahuatl language, which was the lingua franca, the most important language in the time, was uh, common. So the the name for a market was Tianquistli, and we we call it today in Mexico in Spanish Tianguis. So if you go to Mexico and you go visiting any small town, even major cities, but mostly small towns, and Mexico City, by the way. Um, so you'll hear a lot about Tianguis or Mercado Sobre Ruedas, which is basically, it means um, like a mo movi movable market, sort of. That's my translation. Anyway, so yeah, that's the whole culture that revolves around this idea of markets that we still have in Mexico since more than 5,000 years ago. So that's way in our culture, in our DNA, the whole idea of markets and not only markets, the idea of free markets. So we see more images of these. These are just mock-ups like idealized mock-ups that you can see on museums in Mexico City uh, like for instance in the anthropology museum in Mexico City um, and by the way I, uh, I do not fully endorse these images because a lot of times um, scholars try to portray our ancestors as being half-naked savages and which they were not and and yesterday I was talking about the weather down in Mexico City. If you've been in Mexico City at least, at least for six months, you know that it's cold. It gets really cold, especially in the afternoons, during the night, early morning. So basically the only like good weather is around midday, uh, noon. But usually it rains a lot and it's cold. It's almost like, uh, ironically, like a European uh, climate weather pattern in Mexico City. That's why that area, not only Mexico City, but the whole valley of Mexico uh, was really a place, a cradle of, of, of nations, of empires, because a lot of cities could uh, uh, grow in that kind of weather it's a good weather but anyway that's what I, that's what i'm saying about these images it's it's not they are not they're not my images i do not endorse them but i have to show some visuals before people start slamming me with sources sources i need sources that's what people always say anyway so socialists according to the definition usually are hostile to free market economy as to the way best way to maximize human happiness. Now, our ancestors were happy. We know that um, you can see murals in Totihuacan, you can see murals in a lot of places, and 
figurines from Chupicuaro and Tlatilco. I mean, for thousands of years, they have expressed from Veracruz uh, smiling faces um, in statues, statuettes, uh, books, because our ancestors had, ancestors had books. So why was, I mean, they were happy in general. But one of the reasons was because contrary to what this definition of what socialists try to avoid, they try to, socialists try to avoid poverty, suffering, and unemployment. Problem is that back then, there was no poverty. There were no poor people. You could be, you could suffer from different things, but not poverty. If there, uh, I mean, it's, it talks also about unemployment, which, by the way, there was no unemployment. And one of the reasons was because, and I've talked about this in other videos, like if you were good at something, you were kind of forced or pushed into that. So in that case, you didn't have that much of a choice if you were really good, for instance, in math. So if you were good in math, you could end up being an engineer. By the way, it doesn't matter if you were a male or a female because a lot of women were warriors. A lot of women were uh, poets and rulers, by the way, generals and uh, political advisors. We know this because, for instance, the Mayan Mayan people left a lot of info on all of this, uh, on how women were in different kind of jobs, not just cleaning the house. So we know that, by the way, that was way before Hillary Clinton. That was feminism thousands of years before uh, Hillary Clinton or whatever, you know. So in that case, we also debunk a lot of things that socialists or at least that we could say that our indigenous ancestors were socialists. So, uh, yeah. Estrella Apolonia says she's watching from, Me uh, from New Mexico in the U.S. So, yeah, a lot of people from not only the West Coast, but also New Mexico, Texas, sending a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, saludos all over the place. By the way, also people that are watching from abroad as well, not just the U.S., but I know mainly, mainly, like, people tend to watch my videos from the U.S. How do I know? Because uh, st the statistics on YouTube. By the way, we're over 20K followers. This is the reason why I'm starting to do more lives, because as we reach this milestone of, 20,000 followers on my YouTube channel. So it's my duty now to step it up and bring more quality content to you. And when I say quality, it's not just about the graphics and the cool AI, which you will see more of that, but I'm talking more about the content of the quality, uh, the, the quality of the content of the information that I'm giving. So probably like these lectures, they may seem a mm, kind of deep because they are kind of in depth. But I'll try to do some more light lectures uh, nearby in the future. Anyway, so yeah, those are images of the free market. And like I was saying, so we had a free market economy, but we didn't have private entrepreneurship in the sense that they in the sense listen to me that there was not this idea of having companies and boss and boss you know the boss of the company but also the idea of gathering or accumulating capital like for instance a lot of socialists would argue to be against so in that sense if there were, if there was no private entrepreneurship and this uh, hoarding of wealth, accumula accumulating wealth, then in that sense, 
we wouldn't be that much of capitalists or right-winged. So we're debunking socialists as being in our political DNA in Mesoamerica, but we are also debunking right-winged. The problem is that it's really difficult to pinpoint because our societies work different than from Europe. For instance, in Europe, uh, we had a lot of families that gathered power, even greater power in a lot of kingdoms, greater power than uh, the actual king. For instance, in Spain, in medieval Spain, uh, the families, no, noble families, and um, actually w had more money and more power within Spain than the actual king. For instance, in Galicia or Leon or Asturias, a lot of these families had more power, even military power, by the way. So we see that trend going in Europe in the way of having people of power coming from money, especially all money. And we see that evolving into what we later knew, know on the uh, industri Industrial Revolution as being um, companies hiring people to work for them. And in our case, in ancient Mexico and Central America, there were no companies as such. And it, that's really hard to explain, even though they were there were people who who were selling I don't know tomatoes for instance, so people were selling their tomatoes. Probably the own, the 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 same family that's being taking care of the of the fields where tomatoes come from. But that's not the only issue. The issue is also who makes the transportation of those tomatoes to the different markets, and that's where now we have the the different people who traveled all over not only ancient mexico but also central america and even all the way to the southwest us i'm talking new mexico arizona nevada california we have found evidence of objects from that area in the us all the way to central america and we know that they they went through the uh, the corridor, uh, the commercial corridor that the Purépechas had in the Purépecha Empire in Michoacán, what we know today as Michoacán, Jalisco, parts of Kalima, parts of yeah that area. So we know those Purépecha had access to those markets in New Mexico in. Uh, Arizona, in Nevada, but they also had access to uh, merchandise in Central America and the Caribbean. And a lot of these uh, empires served as a hub, as a commercial hub, a trading hub. And that's where their power stemmed from. So when we hear that, okay, so they relied a lot on commerce. And they actually, like I said last week, they actually went to war to capture those different markets and also those commercial corridors. That's, for instance, the main reason how Teotihuacan became to be what we know today as a huge, huge uh, nation state that... Uh, that expanded all of, all over Mexico and Central America. So yeah, that's basically what we uh, let me sh uh, say. So yeah, so we know that and that sounds right winged or kind of right winged, um, putting all that um, putting all that uh, weight on the economy, especially the markets, the import export economy, but. It wasn't. And the, one of the reasons it wasn't is because in markets, let me show you another image of the markets. So in markets, 
we had a control. So there was free market and they were all about free market unless they engage in said free market within established boundaries and who established it the, the state the government the, the kingdom whatever you want to call it the king and there was the, the government had these rules set that only within a certain area in the city was permitted to conduct uh, this business of selling and buying. And one of the reasons, there are many reasons. First of all, this avoids disorder. Like you wouldn't see in every corner people selling like we see today in Mexico. That's That would be a huge no-no. Like those vendors in on the street, you know, in every corner. For our ancient ancestors, that would be a no-no. So you would say, well, so much for a free market. So free market was A-OK -okay as long as you would exercise such free market within a compound or within an area. For instance, in Tlatelolco, the huge market in Tlatelolco, let me show you the image. So in Tlatelolco, you see uh, uh, Tlatelolco was one of the huge, the, the most important markets, not only in Mesoamerica, but probably in the entire world. It was huge. And the quantity of goods that were traded there, I mean, the market was so important. And ironically, the market was not in the Mexica Aztec capital. It was in Tlatelolco, which is, by the way, nearby, it's just the difference, like a difference, like New York and New Jersey, or LA and Anaheim or Malibu. I don't know. I'm just like comparing how uh, uh, just you would just cross uh, the streets, or in this case, the canals, because back then they had canals, and uh, basically you would be in another city. So the Tlatelolco city proper would be the one that had the market, the Tienkistli. Now, within the compound, one of the, uh, another reason why our uh, ancient uh, rulers forced people to have or engage in free market within the compounds of that particular physical uh, place was because there was, um, like an uh, almost independent, quasi-independent uh, administration within the market. And there were actually three, uh, not judges, they would be like administrators. So there were three administrators from which one was the most important one. And they administered the whole functioning of the market. And... It was a special place. If you went in, it was because you went to to buy or sell. And there was an order to that. And there was, um, uh, you were being protected by the state, by the government, that uh, everything was okay, that there was no crime or whatever. That was one of the reasons that y you were super protected. A lot of people describe this as a mall. I wouldn't describe it as a mall. I actually think that it was uh, like that, a market where not only you see goods, but also prices are fixed and where the government, the state would have or would house, it would house the uh, all, all things financial in the Altepet. The, the Altepet would be the nation state or the state. Uh, when I say state, it means the count, the, 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 the yeah, the country. Because the other day I was talking about that on Twitter. Uh, how I was saying that the U.S. is a failed state as a joke, and uh, and the Karen answered that she responded to me on Twitter. This Karen and said. Well, you know, the U.S. can't be a state because we are the United States. And I'm talking about the state 
as nation state. That's political. That's political science. Now, what else? So, another issue would be common ownership. Important productive, important productive properties, things that we need to produce what human beings want, desire, and need to survive, like infrastructure, transport, communication, produce, food, land. It should not be private owned. It should be owned by the government for the benefit of everyone. That's what, that's not me. That's what these notes say, these political science notes coming from college. So, that's important to note because back then, so there was uh, private property, but only, yes, within the limits of a person or a family. And we know that because King Netzahualcoyot would make laws, really strict laws, by the way, and where he would, uh, Netzahualcoyot established a lot of uh, judiciary circuits that would enable judges to prosecute. And not only that, to give opportunity for those being prosecuted to have um, a second chance of being judged again. So w we know that whenever private property was affected, there was a response from the state. In this case, the governments of the, the Aztecs or the Mayans, whatever you want to say. And we know there was also another case of these um, witches. So, so here's the story. In the times of Netzahualcoyot, there were witches who would rob people from their houses. And it was a time where these witches would perform these... I don't know if spells would be the right word, or probably they used uh, chemicals to induce sleep into these person, these people. Entire families would go to sleep, hypnotized, quote unquote. And so these robbers, or you know, witches, wizards, nawales, whatever you want to call them, brujas, they would once the people in the house were hypnotized, they would. Uh, take all things, all the valuables from their home. So uh, when Netzahualcoyot, um, uh knew about this trend, he immediately went after them and prosecuted them. And obviously, the the punishment was death. And like most time, most you hear a lot about that. That the punishment for any crime doesn't matter how light the crime would be, would be capital punishment, death, basically. So that's an, uh, that's an example of how we know there was private property. So in that case, it says that socialists, they don't see uh, private property as being productive or important. No, it was important so much that our ancient ancestors would go to great lengths to create laws to protect private property from people. Now, about, uh, it was uh, infrastructure and the like. So infrastructure was built by the people. Now, we don't have a concept like that today in Western civilization. Let me show you a picture of how people engaged in the tekio. Now the tekio, it's the way of having people do and take care and protect all things about the community and about their city, about their town. And obviously, obviously in, in an expanded way about the whole nation. In this case, we see Tequio in Mexico, in the state of Oaxaca. This is a picture, it's a real picture of, of people engaging in Tequio, which is basically, today we, we only see Tequio in southern Mexico as seeing people cleaning streets, cleaning highways, actually building highways, um, taking care of public spaces, 
that's what we see today in Mexico. Still today, the 21st century, we still see Tequio. Now, the Spanish talks about this, but, you know, like all Western people, white people, usually they're obsessed with their uh, propaganda, war propaganda to cover their war crimes about uh, they're always talking about human sacrifices and cannibal cannibalism and things that they there are actually there's no proof and we've talked about that so we hear a lot of that even though there's no proof but you don't hear ancient aliens talking about tekio which was vital it was so important for our societies you don't you never hear the discovery channel you never hear anyone talking about how our ancient ancestors had this system in which people, everyone, were hands-on on beautifying and building their own city, their own environments. Here's another picture of, this is nowadays, again, of people engaging in techio. Like I said, a lot of people engage in techio to clean to uh, take care of uh, vegetation near the, the highways and what have you. But we also see it in towns, like I said, in cities. And uh, back then, it was not only the same, it was actually like more important because all buildings we see, every city, every building we see, let me, sh let me show you, like this building. Whenever you see these ancient buildings from our ancient ancestors, they were not made by slaves. They were made by Tekio, like I said. So the, commu the entire community would be in super engaged. They were intrinsical in the creation of infrastructure, but also, amongst other things, services, even though there was a government. So at first you see, okay, you can see that so there's no private property in the sense of the city. So it belongs to everyone. And that sounds kind of kind of communist. I don't know. Not only that, that people are actually engaged in these communal activities. Again, uh, this could very well hint as something that in the sense of pure capitalism that we haven't seen by the way in in our world usually it's a very shaky political system but here for thousands of years we see people creating empires the people even though they were they might have a king or an emperor or what have you actual people engaged in tekio and tekio was the way to build and beautify and everything so so we have no poverty because there was no lack of um uh, of jobs because everyone was engaged in their own jobs for the benefit of everyone and when i say that it sounds fantastic by the way that's what the idea of Star Trek comes from, and a lot of people from the right wing criticize Star Trek, uh, not only for being progressive, but because of this idea of in in the series, TV series, and the movies. You see people in Star Trek saying that uh, their jobs and their careers are not money oriented; that they are oriented towards the greater good of society now star trek is a sci-fi franchise it's from cbs obviously but it's a figment of the imagination of gene roddenberry but for more than five thousand years this happened in ancient mexico and central america which is guatemala belize honduras el salvador and nicaragua and we see these communal ideas. So it sounds, it could sound a lot like communism, 
But wait. We have rulers. We have kings. This is, for instance, the Ajao, the ruler, King Pakal from Palenque, Chiapas. And we see this is his coronation. The, the they uh, it was he was crowned by the way by her by his mother. So we not only see evidence. I always say about evidence. I always talk about evidence, and I will always defend evidence. And that's why I'm against the idea of human sacrifices and cannibalism and pozole made out of human meat. And being savages because we were there, there, there are no proofs about that. But we here we have pre contact proof, pre contact evidence before the Spanish came of kings being crowned in their throne. So remember, we were talking, okay, so the society, and this is the confusing gray area, we see a society turning to the left in things of of uh, maintaining the city of everyone chipping in but then we have a high ruler could be a man or a female by the way Pakal's mom was uh, the queen of Palenque but because of uh, political uh, instability she had to make a uh, Pact with another clan, because in the case of the Mayans, and not only Mayans, the Aztecs, everyone uh, had their political uh, landscape divided by clans or calpuli or what have you, you know, different groups. And in order to avoid a political crisis, she handed over the crown. So again, we have a king or a queen. Uh, one high ruler, but then we see that there's people that could be angry about that. So they are not absolute rulers like the kings of France, for instance. So Erika says, <laughs> because it's not, Erika says, because it's not controversial and it's not putting indigenous people as savages. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point that I didn't realize. That's why I love reading comments because as long as it's not controversial and you don't see blood, you know, um, so it's not gonna be a sexy thing to say in ancient aliens or the books or scholars, academia, what have you. So yeah, so uh, we were talking about how uh, scholars and people and the media don't talk about take you. So we have kings. Here's another king. Tlatuani Tesosomoc from Azcapotzalco. But we also have uh, people engaging in take you. Again, let me show you the image. Where's the image here? So there's a struck. We, we could say it's a stark contrast, but it was not for our ancestors. So people had power. And we are actually, like we said, for some reason, the different cl clans didn't like so much Sak Cook becoming queen of Palenque, even though she had to at the beginning because she was... Uh, helping the city come out from a dark place after after war, but once she accomplished that, she was not pushed, but you know, like say, show, like they were showing her the door, and she said, "Okay, I would leave. I I will leave my seat of power, but we need to come to an arrangement." And, and the, there was an arrangement. We can see about that in. Palenque's history, how Pakal was the golden child that everyone chose to become the new king. And by the way, out of this um, uh, nepotistic way of putting Pakal, Pakal actually became one of the greatest, if not the greatest king that the Mayans ever had. 
and probably one of the best as well of all Mesoamerica and all the Amer uh, the the Americas. So yeah, we see uh, this idea of having kings, and actually, our the current government of Mexico is left winged, led by Andrés Manuel López Obrador or AMLO. So AMLO took the image of Netzahualcoyotl, King Netzahualcoyotl, from the Mex Mexican money. So we don't have Netzahualcoyotl anymore in Mexican money. I don't know if because it's out of fear that perhaps they don't want Mexicans, they don't want us seeing monarchy as an option. And again, monarchy, it's not left-winged. And per perhaps this is a reason why AMLO, President AMLO from Mexico, took King Netzahualcoyotl from the Mexican money. But curiously enough, we see her candidate, Claudia Sheinbaum, which will probably be the next president of Mexico. And we see her uh, when she was Me Mexico City's mayor engaging in Tequio. So Claudia Sheinbaum and the party of AMLO, the, the current ruling party in Mexico, Morena, that's the name of the political party. So Morena sees okay to engage in Tequio, which is a very, like I said, a very communal way of engagement and community activity and um, volunteerism as well. By the way, probably the idea of volunteers was invented as well in our ancient Mexico and Central America. So it's okay to engage in Tequio because it looks or sounds left-winged, but it's not okay to have kings and queens and, and or sexy princesses. Because I say that because the other day I was talking about Princess Atotostli and how she was the equivalent of Helen of Troy in ancient Mexico and her beauty actually caused a war, a, a, a great, uh, war that almost almost destroyed a lot of cities. Actually, Tepozotlan was set on fire, and uh, yeah, a lot of cities. Uh, it, it was mayhem back then in times of Princess Atotostli. And a lot of people argue, "Oh no, that's just nonsense." Uh, sources, sources. They 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 start you know babbling that I should present. There are sources. And you can see the Historia Chichimeca, the Mapa Kinatsin, the Mapa Xolotl. There's a lot of sources that talks about uh, Princess Atotostli, for instance, and that how her beauty, she was hot, and how she, that provoked a war. So for a lot of lead-winged people, that's a no-no. Like... Like I was reading you from the notes. Again, it's not my opinion. The notes say that we should maximize human happiness and suffering and all of that, which is left-winged. But then we have right-winged ideals in the sense of monarchy. Um, socialists, there's another idea. Socialists recognize that people can't be equal in every aspect, but we could do better to reduce inequalities of wealth, income, status, power, etc. amongst members of society. The tools to do that are planning and common ownership. Like I said, there was private ownership. So we debunked left wings, the left wing ideal. And... But they had this idea of reducing inequality of wealth because there was no wealth. How do we know that? Oh my God, where is it? Here. So we had money. That's our money. Uh, cacao beans were used as currency back then. Uh, not only with the Mayans, but also with the Aztecs, everyone used cacao beans to buy or sell things. Again, currency. Now, back then, money grew from trees. 
So this is from where cacao beans come from. And by the way, chocolate, because chocolate comes from cacao. So this is the, the tree from where chocolate comes from. So we see this huge um, thing, I don't know what's it called. Once it's opened, you see that white, the, the series of white things, that's the cacao. And when it's once it's cleaned, it looks like this. Now we know that the cacao beans were used as currency and we have even found, we have even, there's evidence of counterfeit, of fake money. In this case, in, instead of fake money, we find evidence of fake cacao seeds. So there's evidence of counterfeit, like probably, I don't know, for some reason, they made these seeds. They look like, like the seeds, but they're made out of um, uh, adobe, um, burned, uh, you know, I forgot the name. So like the way ceramics or figurines are made, that's how they made those seeds and with the, the the shape and everything. So we know that seeds were used as currency, but also this. So probably seeds were used for small as a small denomination currency, but these were used as to buy bigger things or more expensive things. Fun fact, when the Spanish came to the Mayan lands, um, King, King Tapscob of um, Campeche, that whole area, when, when the Spanish came, and once King Tapscob was defeated, uh, as a sign of, of recognizing their defeat to the Spanish, they gave him a lot of, uh, well, the Spanish describes as clothes, and they didn't understand why they got a lot of cloaks like this. And the, um, the reason is because it's money. It's like here, I mean, here's some money. You, you, you win. And the design for those are like this. There's a lot of, there, there could be a lot of designs, but this is just an example. And this is an idea of how designs would be for those cloaks. Those cloaks would be, men would put them as cloaks, <laughs> and uh, but they, they were also used as currency. There's also this idea of, uh, so we have cacao beans, we have those clothing cloaks as currency, but there's a third option that we've seen as being used as currency. So whenever they wanted to, let's say, buy a house or buy, I don't know, something big, something huge, you wouldn't have a lot of cacao beans or a lot of cloaks. They would buy such goods with metal uh, access. So metal existed back then, but it wasn't so common. And these metal axes were like this big something like that. So they would uh, give it as currency. It they would serve the purpose of currency. So we, again, we see that, uh, so yeah, the wealth couldn't be accumulated if we used perishables, like seeds, like in this case, cacao beans. So uh, imagine you can accumulate as much as you want, but sooner or later, I mean, they have an expiration date and they would expire and wealth, it's, it wasn't uh, an idea or a notion like we do today as being a wealthy, a wealthy person, wealthy people would be someone that has accumulated a lot of wealth. That means money or properties or what have you but in this case it was dif difficult very difficult to to have this idea of wealth because there were no rich people in europe there were rich people 
for millennia, even from the from Roman times, from the ancient Roman times and what have you. So a lot of people were rich for whatever reason. Like I said, either they were landowners, either they had uh, power, political power, like I was saying from Spain, in medieval Spain. But yeah, so the idea of wealth wasn't the same. So whenever left-winged uh, people say about whatever they say about wealth, income, status, power, so it's incompatible to the Mesoamerican way. It's incompatible. So if it's incompatible with the left, it would also automatically be incompatible with the right. Why? Because as much as they were conservative, that's a different thing. Our ancestors were, were really conservative. And we still are in Mexico conservative. We tend to be conservative, at least because we, we have a nu nuclear family and we protect our parents, our old uh, parents and grandparents. So that's very conservative, conservative uh, of us. And actually, like Ronald Reagan once said that we Mexicans, um, we're basically conservatives and we don't know it. And so that's a lot of people see us as being conservative, um, but we don't uh, acknowledge that, but we are. The thing is that that's not quite to qualify as right wing, because like I said, there was no wealth. There was no idea of imposing a, 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 a more right wing ideal. And we can show you another reason. How are we doing on time? Oh, yeah. Ben Conmigue says, Clay. Yes. Ah, the, the, the word escaped me. Yes. So it was Clay. Basically, um, yeah, a lot of counterfeit was made with Clay. Um, a lot of things were made with clay, but also with metal, uh, with obsidian as well. But that's another topic. So I want to say something else. Remember the ideas of communal engagement in society? Well, there was also this communal engagement with the government, with the actual government. Even though we had kings and emperors, we had a parliament-style way of doing things. And this, for instance, what you're seeing here is the building, we could say the parliament of Copan, Honduras. So this is in Honduras, in way deep in Central America. In Honduras, which was a Mayan city, uh, powered by Teotihuacan. And uh, this is the building uh, called the Popol Nach. The Popol Nach. Now, the Popol Nach served as the house of the people or the house of the mat. Now, the mat is the... this. This is the reed mat where people would sit and discuss things and that symbol that exact symbol of the mat the we call it in spanish we call it petate which comes from petlat in nahuatl but in the mayan world was uh, pop so that's pop now that's why that's why the the quote unquote parliament was called Popolnach, the house of the people. But again, the house of the mat. You see the symbol. So at the top of the building, not way on the top, above the the door openings. You can see there in the bottom. That symbol is the symbol. For the pop, the mat, the reed mat, and we can actually see this is a this is such a cool picture of someone making a mat 
and you can actually see how it crisscrosses in order to stay put together. Again, see the, see the pattern? And here's the pattern on the top of the Popol Nach, because that, that was the glyphic, the symbol, the, 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 the symbol of the, that, that, the, the, that was a Popol Nach. And above the symbol, you see a lot of glyphs, which indicate uh, places as well as people. So this Popol Nach housed different clans. So they have the names of the clans of the different groups from different regions of Copan. So we have Copan, a powerful kingdom from Honduras. And even though they had a king, a, a very powerful king as well, they had a Popolnaj. And not only one, here's another one. This is also a Popolnaj in Copan, Honduras. So this is the actual archaeological site in Honduras, in Copan. It's a tourist area today, but back then it was a huge, important capital. So much that Teotihuacan grew an interest in capturing this city commercial, commercially. So again, we see the Popol Nach, and again we see the symbol of the Popol Nach above, which means that's the place where the people sit, where the people talks. How do they talk? This is an image from Japan. So this mat in Japan is called the tatami. The tatami, basically, it's a mat. But not only that, that people use it to sit, people use it to as a way, uh, a special, uh, a way to express uh, their space as Japanese people. Japanese are so much into how spaces look. They're so into it, Japanese. And we can actually see similarities of Japanese culture and uh, cultures from Asia with our ancient ancestors. So we see this, this has nothing to do with Mesoamerica. I'm just showing you pictures of Japan of how people engaged, um, again, talking in the tatami. We see that in Japan, a lot of uh, big business actually is conducted in these areas of the tatami. There we see the sacred ceremony of the tea. Again, ceremony of the tea. Seems like these people are showing this foreigner in the tatami, the ways of the Japanese people. You see also that people are without shoes. For instance, here we see the Japanese prime minister with the British prime minister, the British, the British prime minister, and they're actually having fun. If this would happen in Mexico, or if this would happen in Central America, they would say, oh, look, that's a banana republic. They're making the British Prime Minister take their shoe, his shoes off and showing his red socks. They're having fun. You can see they're having fun. They are powerful people that are abiding by the local customs of Japan. And the same way that Japanese conduct even their political business, important business, that's the same way Back then, people conduct business in the Mayan world, in the Aztec world. For instance, we see here with the Mexica Aztecs, their ruler, is, this is Moctezuma, II, Moctezuma II, and Moctezumatzin Xocoyotzin. We see him in the top with his crown, the Copili. But in the bottom, what for me, it's striking. And again, I don't, we don't see anyone talking about that in the Discovery Channel, in Ancient Aliens, in CNN, we don't see anyone talking about that. How in the palace of Emperor Moctezuma II, we see he, a parliament. And we see, it says here in Spanish, Sala del Consejo de Moctezuma, which means 
Hall of the Council of Moctezuma. So that's the Council of Moctezuma, the Council of Four. But it was a way for people to express themselves, ordinary people, through the channels of their respective different clans. You see the symbol? Again, can I try and make it bigger? A lot of people say to me, you know, we don't believe you. A lot of people say that. So you see here, the mat, that's the symbol. That's the parliamentary symbol. This is the Aztecs. This is the Mayan, the Mayan people. This is in the 16th century. This is in the 6th century, when I say 5th century, but that's not all. Palenque also had Popolnach. So wait, so we have kings, mighty rulers, but we also have the people governing? Is it logical this? This is the palace complex in Palenque, Chiapas, home of Pacal. Remember Pacal, who was crowned by her mother? Well, this is his home. His palace was here. He slept there. We actually know where the bathroom is. <laughs> it's, well, I can't show you with my mouse, but it's right in the bottom of that tower. Well, not, not in the bottom, like to the side. So we know a, lo a lot about this palace complex. We even have a map. This blueprint show us show, is showing us the different palaces. Obviously, because scholars, you know, white people, instead of palace, they call it house. Because the Mayans had this idea of calling house to everything. Anyway. So we see house A, D, house C, house D, blah, blah, blah. What's important to me is house B. Can you locate house B? <laughs> I sound like Dora the Explorer, but, <laughs> but yeah. Can you see house B? So it's in the middle. House B is the Popolnach of Palenque. So this is house B, the one in the left. Let me show you. I'm putting myself next to house B. That's house B. So you see, this is the whole complex of Palenque. This is where Pacal, the great Pacal lived. But this building, the one I, I, I'm putting myself here, this building is the Popolnach of Palenque, the parliament, the house of the people. The house of the different clans where they would gather together. But not only that, they served as ad advisors as well or as advisees. I mean, because we see in the middle, you see, I'm putting myself next to a corridor. Do you see this secret corridor? I don't know if you're being, if you're able to see this secret corridor next to the Popolnach. So the secret corridor I'm talking about is this one. So that's the corridor. Yeah, that one over here. Not this one, that one. So there's, here's the corridor and you can actually see the people, today tourists, they're taking some time off of walking at the archeological site in the very steps of the Popolnach. Now, this palace, the Popolnach, is connect, connected through this hall, this corridor down here. This is the corridor. And I'm, I know I'm making quite a fuss about the corridor. I promise it's going to be really cool. So this is the corridor of the Popolnach, the parliament of Palenque connecting to the White House. No, seriously, this is called the White House house that's the name of the ruler of palenque's palace that's where uh, king pacal was crowned 
that's where King Pakal uh, received his ambassadors and people. Uh, very important meetings were held there. Basically, that's the heart, the most important place in the whole of the Palenque Kingdom. Back then, Palenque was called La Camha. La Camha. So basically, this is the Sakna, the White House. The White House. That's the real name. I'm, I'm, I kid you not. This is the real name. The White House where King pa Pakal of Palenque ruled. So again, we see this idea of connecting the most important place for the king, the Ahau, with a communal space within the palace, the palace complex. The whole complex is connected. So that's really neat to know. Uh, we see also the idea of Popol Nag in Ek Balam. This is another kingdom of the Mayans. Uh, this is in uh, uh, later, uh, uh, the post-classic era. So we see those are the Popol Nag of Ek Balam. Here's another uh, Popol Nag of the, of the kingdom of Kiwik. And actually in the bottom we see the artistic rendering of what the, that specific Popol Nag would look like. Again, this house of the people, the house of or parliament uh, of the Mayan political system. Here in Kiwik we can actually see circled the Popol Nag which is strategically positioned. El Grito Kid says, what's your name? So we can read your anthropological work. El Grito Kid, your real, your real name, that is. Your work is published under, please. Yeah, I'm going to tell you my name. You can actually look me up on, uh, look me up on uh, LinkedIn as Angel Omaña. Put my name. But yeah, I um, haven't published anything lately. I'm going to publish something more related to Northern Mexico. By the way, uh, I've also written a, a novel that's not scholarly per se, but uh, I, I've written a novel. If you want to read it, it's more um, love oriented, but it, it's still historical. And yeah, you can also hit me up on the on LinkedIn or whatever, and I'm gonna show you the link to my to my novel, to my book. Um, anyway, so here's another Popolnach. But here's the deal: whenever people see this building, they see serpents, scary images. You see here. I mean, the Mexican flag tells me snakes are bad. We see monsters here. Scary monsters. So, obviously, people and academia says, you know what? These people are scary. These, these people have 24-7 Halloween style, but it's not. This is another Popolnag. This is a Popolnag in Uxmal. We know it today as Uxmal. So this is Uxmal or Uxmal, whatever, however you want to proper, properly would be Uxmal. But a lot of people say Uxmal. So that's Uxmal. That's the Popol Nag. But actually, uh, Americans, American scholars call it not a Popol Nag, but actually they call it a Super Nag. That's how they call it. I don't like that name. I would I would call it just properly Popolnag or a super Popolnag. But yeah, they, this is what uh this is what Parliament looks like in Uxmal. And we can see here, obviously, a uh, TikToker or whatever, I don't know. There's a blonde. I don't know how she got here. Anyway. But here we can see the Popolnag. Uh, structure, building, palace, whatever you want to call it, where people met. 
to discuss public affairs. And again, this is no minor kingdom. You see, this is beautiful. Uxmal, Ushmal, whatever you want to say. This is not Ushmal. This is not Ushmal. So we were talking about the Mexica Aztecs, but we also see Netzahualcoyot. This is the palace of Texcoco in Netzahualcoyot. Uh, in the time of Netzahualcoyotl, poet king Netzahualcoyotl. And the th interesting thing about his palace outline is how it's composed of an open court, first of all. Like you can see in the middle, the open court. Not only that, he, in the bottom, I don't know if you see those Netzahualcoyotl, let me show you. So this one is Nezahualcoyot. Yeah. This one is Nezahualpili, his son. So you would argue, okay, so we have a dynastic thing here going on. But then here, we have his, his council. And his primary council is composed by these four guys. You see these dudes? Four? Remember the council of four? from the uh, Mexica Aztecs. These guys, they're also four. But again, we see the uh, arrangement of the palace of Netzahualcoyotl, similar to what we see similar. It's not the same, but similar to what we see in Palenque. Where's the Darn, here it is. You see the layout? So we see the palace of um, the proper area of Pakal, which is in the middle. It's called House E. That's the White House, the Saknach. But next to the Saknach, we see House B, which is the Popolnach, the parliament, surrounded by different other palaces and what have you. Same goes with Netzahualcoyot. We see the proper uh, room for the throne. We, act, we can actually see King Netzahualcoyot sitting in his throne, the Iqpali, and his son as well. Then we see his council, but we also see different, what, what they look like rooms. They are not different rooms. They're different palaces within this huge palace complex and a lot of those actually are embassies and different um, areas of government and as well as things related to uh, judgments uh, what was it called like courts and stuff N not courts like we know it today but we but you get the idea so yeah in LinkedIn you can find me as Angel Omaña if not, if you're having trouble, just ask me. But yeah, uh, act I haven't done actual academic work as of lately. And um, back then, like, I think way before when the internet was beginning, I didn't have the chance to publish what I... I did a work on explaining how... Um, the militaristic view of the Mexica Aztec stemmed from Azcapotzalco. That's a study I made. But I'm, I'm going to do something on northern Mexico, which is something different. And especially because there's this area in Tamaulipas, which has been destroyed and actually is still being destroyed as we speak by the Mexican federal government, by President AMLO in Nuevo Laredo, where I saw uh, evidence of human settlement. Um, so I'm going to write about that more scholarly, if you will. But yeah, oh, you found me. Okay, yeah, just add me or send me a message, whatever. And yeah, we can talk more. Uh, so if you want to talk more, by the way, if you want to be in touch with, with me or you want to be interviewed, perhaps, perhaps you want to be interviewed, you wanna write me 
to my uh, there it is so that's my email anawak encyclopedia at gmail.com so, so that's my email where you can write me whatever you want or if you think you you want i mean if you want to be interviewed for a lot of people do a lot of interesting stuff so if you want to be interviewed i mean i'll, I'll be glad to interview you so that's so that's that and thank you so much for watching i'm gonna try and do more lives uh, sometimes people watch my lives very closely but sometimes i know people are busy and uh, a lot of people write to me that they are actually uh, watching my lives after uh, after the li they're live so you can re-watch them whatever you want and if you have any questions you can email me or you can like i said if you have anything interesting you're doing culture wise to uh, all things indigenous or native from mexico and central america please write to me email me or contact me and we can arrange some sort of interviews interviews are coming but I haven't been, uh, El Grito Kid says, okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks to you. By the way, thanks to you people because uh, your interest has um, has me giving, uh, has, there's this idea of the more people are interested in this stuff, the more quality I have to invest. And I'm not talking about just investment but also time and also quality. And I, like I said, I'm going to do more quality um, in, uh, info on this, on all this Mesoamerican stuff. But yeah, so basically that's it. That's my that's my lecture for today. If you, I don't know if you have any questions. No, that's all. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go. So today's our anniversary. Yes. <laughs> but it's not are it's not i'm not talking about the youtube channel i'm talking about my wife so today's our anniversary of being boyfriend and girlfriend yeah so 20 years. 20 years of being boyfriend and girlfriend 20 years it's easy to it's easy said but it's not that hard <laughs> it's not that i'm saying it's hard but <laughs> <laughs> but it is <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 it's not that hard, but I think, I, I think, and you can agree with me that we have lived uh, a lot of things, yes. heavy stuff. Yes, ups and downs. Ups and downs throughout these 20 years, 20 years, that's a lot. Uh, so basically, yeah, that today, so we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, and even though there's no time for us to do a romantic dinner, we're still having dinner, right? Yeah. Probably watch the nanny or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so so that's that's my life. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Again, if you you can watch my view my my other videos, don't re, uh, don't forget to subscribe if you're interested in these topics. Give uh, give like to these videos. But the thing that the way you can help me a lot, by the way, is to pass it along. Please Pass it along. If you think this is valuable or this is noteworthy, pass it along 